service, we have a time of sharing our joys and our concerns, and since there's no one in the sanctuary, uh, we can't take prayer concerns. So I want to take a moment and ask you to think of someone that you need to pray for. And during the prayer, I'll just pause, we'll have a moment of silence, and you can lift up those people that you'd like to pray for. I do have a couple of concerns that I'd like to add to the list. Uh, one is, we, a few weeks ago, the last time we had worship in our sanctuary, I talked about a little boy by the name of Hunter. And Hunter uh, has come out of surgery, and he's from California, but the surgery was in, in Florida to help him walk. And um, I have good news, he re he's out of surgery, recovering very well, and uh, as he was coming out of surgery, he said to his family that they said everything went well, and he said, I know it would be because, no kidding, the people of Ottawa Reformed Church are praying for him. And so he has received your cards and letters, and so I just want to thank everybody for doing that. I also want to lift up um, a friend of mine, Lawrence, from uh, California. Um, he's in his mid-70s, and he has gone to the hospital. They think he may have coronavirus as well as a, a friend of mine's daughter, uh, she's from Minnesota, um, she is a nurse, and she too might have coronavirus, um, so I think we need to pray for these people, and particularly the medical field. Um, so let's, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, Lord, we know that you answer prayers. We know, Lord, that you hear us. And you always, you always respond. So Lord, help us to wait upon you and help us to listen to your spirit and help us to know, Lord, that you are always, always, always with us. Lord, oftentimes when we feel alone, oftentimes when we feel that there's no one around listening to us, we know, Lord, that you, you are listening to us. So hear our prayers, O oh Lord. Tonight we pray for Sue Burr. Lord, we're thankful that you are walking every step with her as she goes through these chemotherapy treatments. Lord, heal her body and release her from this cancer. We're thankful, Lord, for Bob Cherry, who was feeling much better. Lord, he's thankful for all the prayers, and we lift him up, and we, we continue to praise you, Lord, for answer prayer. Lord, we pray for Jerry. And Lord... As he completed five weeks of chemo, Lord, for cancer, we pray, Lord, that he will have renewed health and renewed strength. For it's so difficult, Lord, to, to go through that process and have depleted all your strength. Lord, strengthen his body. And for Cindy and Roger Jacobs, Lord, we're thankful that you are are with Cindy as she's going through these immunotherapy treatments, Lord, and, and for Roger, Lord, who is on the liver transport list, bless this couple, Lord. For Ken Merriman, Lord, who who's, uh, continues with physical therapy, watch over him, and yes, Lord, we pray again that you strengthen, strengthen his body. And Lord, we, we pray for Neil, Lord, who is diagnosed with lung cancer, Lord, we are so tired of hearing that word cancer. Lord, there are so many people that are struggling with that, so we, we pray that you release them, heal their body. We pray for Paul, Lord, who's also having chemotherapy treatments. For Michael, Lord, who's had this blood clot disorder. We pray for his complete healing, Lord, for all those in Kids Hope. We pray for the fourth grade teachers, Emily and Kim, Lord, even though they are home, not with their kids, we know, Lord, we know, Lord, that they're anxious to get back to school. So bless them and bless all the teachers. You know, Sheila and her, her student, Dale. And Lord, I am working with Avery and I ask a special blessing on Avery as well. For all the kids, Lord, who are missing school and missing friends, we ask, Lord, that you, Lord, be with them in the middle of this confusion of not knowing why they can't go to school. Lord, bless them. 
For those in the military, Daniel and Jason and Noah and Chris and Robin and Ryan and, and Logan. Lord, for those who protect us, protect us on these shores and the shores that are far away, Lord, we ask that you bless them, Lord, remind them, Lord, that you will lead them and you will guide them. No matter what they're called to do. Lord, we pray for our missionaries in Mexico, Jamie and Martha. Strengthen them, Lord, as they share the gospel. And Lord, I do thank you for Hunter and for bringing him through this, this, uh, this surgery, Lord. Bless his parents. And Lord, we pray that, yes, one way he will be able to walk again. And Lord, I pray for my friend Lawrence and, and for Karen, who both may have this coronavirus. Lord, we lift up to you our nation, and we lift up to you all those, Lord, all the healthcare workers, Lord, heal their bodies and help them stay strong, Lord, so that they may be in the hospitals caring for, for those who are most sick. Lord, we do, not, we do not need the people who take care of us sick. And Lord, may the hospitals get all the supplies that they need. Lord, Lord, we are struggling with this shortage. So, Lord, we pray for all those worldwide. You will bring us help. We pray all this in the name of the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
2 Peter chapter 1. We'll walk over and get another stand in a moment. If you can pause that, go get your Bible. Please be with me in 2 Peter chapter 1. This will be a study tonight. Also, if you look online, you should have uh, in an email uh, a, a uh, outline for tonight. Let you get that. With that, a pencil and a pen in hand. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, we love your word. But sometimes your word tells us things that are so difficult that it's hard to understand, it's hard to accept. Tonight we pray for Peter as he wrote the churches that were dispersed all over. And I don't think he wrote this letter just because he wanted to talk to them at that time. But he wanted to talk to Christians at all times. Because if there's one thing we have in common, we need to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we need to know that at the end of our life, I'll explain that in a moment. At the end of our life, we have no doubt that we are in the hands of Jesus Christ. Lord, if I say anything tonight that is not according to your word, I pray that the people who are listening would immediately forget it, just evap evaporate it from their minds. But if I have prayed carefully and listened carefully and written carefully and, and, and come into your presence carefully and your word has jumped off the page, Lord, if I've listened in that way, when I say things according to your most holy word, may they take deep root in our hearing, in our believing, and in our living. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll be reading God's word in just a few minutes. This is Peter's second letter. Remember how Pastor Jim began... First Peter, he said this, and of course he was correct, that First Peter was a book about the suffering for Christ and for the Christian faith. First Peter, a lot of other things, but its theme was, get ready, you're going to suffer for Jesus Christ and for preaching Jesus Christ. Second Peter, however, is primarily written to warn against false teachers and unchristian lifestyle. And listen to this. 2 Peter is being written by a dying man. Now, this is what I mean by that. Like Paul writing 2 Timothy in his letter, from a prison cell, he talks about writing in chains. So Peter is also writing his letter from prison. Maybe some of you didn't know that. He's in prison in Rome where he is facing certain and imminent death for being a Christian. He's been arrested by Nero. Everybody seems to know the guy. A self-proclaimed God who wanted to be worshipped and obeyed by all the people under the Roman rule. He wanted to set himself up as the only God. This letter, as I said in the prayer, has no one church to whom it is written. It is written to the church, wherever that church may be, and I believe whatever time frame it's in. He's writing sort of a general letter to Christians now dispersed because of Nero's incredible persecution. Now, let me go back to his imminent death. Peter must be one of the best Christian leaders. He was one of the best Christian leaders of all time. But I love him because he's normal. <laughs> I kind of like his temper. I kind of like that he, he looks in the garden of, garden of Gethsemane and there's all this great big bunch of people and he pulls a sword as if he's going to take on like a dozen guys. I just kind of like Peter. He's a normal person. And when a normal person knows that they are going to die, they boil life down to the last little while of what's important, what's essential, and what's eternal. That's Peter here. I've had the privilege, and so have you, Jim. Yes, I want to use the word. We have had the privilege of planning funerals with people who are dying, and people who know they're dying, and people who know that they're Christians. Let me do that again. There's a privilege planning a, a funeral for people who know they're dying and know they're Christians. And, writing, and while they're writing these funeral plans, they love to reminisce. They'll just kind of, sometimes a state of weakness, begin to just smile and 
let me share something from my past, Pastor. And then other times they look forward and they say, oh, I hope, I hope, I hope. And they talk about, uh, with 100% honesty, what they would love their loved ones to be, what they love their loved ones to do after they're gone. Now, why do we say that? Well, Peter is writing the second letter with that kind of love, with that kind of reminiscing, with that kind of urgency and that kind of honesty. Let's read just 13 verses. Of first Peter of second Peter and we're going to learn so much tonight here we go his I'll get to that first <laughs> just the first word his his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them we may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, here he says, make every effort, try really hard to supplement your faith with what? With virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with, with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Are we really going to go through all those? Yup. <laughs> For if these qualities are yours, and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sin. Therefore, brothers, sisters, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. Wow, look at that. And, and if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, another word, therefore. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in them, the truth that you have. I think it is right, as long as I am in this body, and he you knows he's dying, to stir you up by way of reminder since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. All right, here we go. I'm going to have seven points tonight, and uh, I told Jim and I laugh. We go into the offices during the week. Um, the P's just jumped off the page. You'll understand what I mean. Look in your outline. Here we go. Number one, and I'm going to put it up there. Here we go. Make sure I put the wrong one. There we go. If you look at verse three, I'm going to reread it again. Just listen. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to the life of godliness. The power that pertains. Again, look in your word. Look at verse 3. It says, His divine power. Please, listen to me. His is simply referring to Jesus Christ. So let's go into it. Jesus Christ has divine power. Now listen, Jesus Christ has godly power, not because at some time in Jesus' life God gave him power. No, no, no. He has power because Jesus Christ is God. Let me do that one again. A lot of people think that the power of Jesus Christ came to him on his baptism or maybe some other time. That's not true. Jesus Christ was not born a pure man and then given God's power. Jesus Christ is God himself. Let's go on. And Jesus Christ has chosen to grant to us Who's us? To Christians, to believers, all things that pertain to, look at your scripture, that pertain to two things, that pertain to life and pertain to godliness. Let's go into life, and I'm going to split that into two things. Life, first of all. All things that pertain to life, first of all, here. In this life, the life we are living. Remember I said the theme of 2 Peter is we need to leave a, live a good Christian life here. It's important. People of God, Christ has given you and I life. 
Christ created us and he sustains us. Christ is the source of this life. So every single breath we take, every single day of our life, minute, second of our life, is a gift from God. Number one, God gives us life. He grants that to us. But that's not where Peter is going to focus on. The second one is, and Christ grants eternal life to us. This is the focus of Peter as he knows he will soon be killed, he will soon be martyred for Christ and leave this life. Peter says, believers, look down again. Christ gave us life and Christ grants to us eternal life. All right, number one life, I said he's going to go to the second one. He also grants to us godliness. Now I'm going to speak about this a little bit later, but let's start here. What godliness means is doing what God wants us to do. Christ sets the rules of how we are to live. Christ tells us what actions are godly and what actions are not godly. Christ determines how to live life appropriately and Christ shows us by how he lived and then he also, listen to me, wrote it down. <laughs> he gave us, verse 3, the knowledge of him who called us to his glory and his excellence. All right, that's a knife. Now, we're not going to all won't quite be that long. Christ gives us the power to live for him and the power to live with him. Life here, life hereafter. The power that pertains to life and God. Let's, let's go to the second one. This one comes from verse 4. And let me just read verse 4 over again. And it goes to this two points in a row. Here we go. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desire. What he says, and I didn't even have to make these up, verse 4, you are partakers of these precious promises. Now, I understand that this world makes us skeptics. I get it. All of us, and I'm going to use the word all. I don't do that a lot in sermons, but I am here. All of us have had promises that we have made and promises that others have made to us. We as human beings make promise, 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 and then for a bad reason, or a good reason, or no reason at all, we've had that promise broken. Our employer breaks promises to us. i got to be fair here. Our employees break promises to us. I don't know how to say this, but parents broke promises. Grandparents break promises. Children break promises. Oh, heaven forbid. Once in a while, even the government breaks promises. I'm going to go on that one a minute. <laughs> On January 7, 27th of this year, January 7th, I want you to give the, the calendar a little bit in your head. I sent a certified check to a man in Iowa. Yep, 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 yes, it's a guy. I'm going to go hunting in Iowa this fall, Lord willing. I waited, I waited three weeks. Certified check was never delivered. He said, write me another one. So I did. Listen to the date. On February 10th, I paid $8. I went and paid, not a stamp, I put eight bucks down on a certified letter because he said, we will promise that it's going to get there. That was what? February 10th. Oh, oh, that's right. That was six weeks ago. I checked the other day. Neither certified check, as God is my witness, has made it there. The United States Post Office Promised delivery, $8 letter, not there. The world makes me skeptical. It becomes a daily practice of human beings breaking promises to one another. And then, praise God, enter Jesus Christ. I love this. He promised to make a way to the Father. And he became our high priest. He promised to forgive our sins. And he became our sacrifice. He promised to pay for our sins. And he gave his life. He promised to conquer death and he rose. He promised to prepare a place for us and he ascended. And even though it cost him everything, including his life, he fulfilled every single promise. Amen. Now, you have to look at those words and now they mean something nice. Christ gives you these precious promises. All right, we're still in... Verse 4, and I didn't have to look for another P. It popped right out. And he says, and you're going to be partakers. 
Remember the last two promises I just said that Christ would conquer death and he promised he would prepare a place for, for, oh, I didn't say that. He would prepare a place for who? He's going to prepare a place for partakers. Now it's time to listen. A partaker is a person who has simply said, Jesus Christ, I am asking you, I want you. We may even say, Lord, I beg you to be my Lord and my Savior. A partaker is one who says, I believe in you, Christ. I believe your promises to be true, and I want to be part of your precious promises. I want to be a partaker. Now, take it from a man who really is is ready to die for his faith. He is. Peter was a partaker in the precious promises of Christ. He knew he would. Look at verse 4. It's sitting on your lap again. He knew he would soon escape from the corruption that is in the world. He's dying. He knows that heaven is real. And for him, heaven is absolutely certain. And heaven for him is soon. Okay. We have to ask and answer a question. I would not be a good pastor, especially coming in the Lent season towards Easter. I'm going to ask you again, what questions do I need to ask? Please, would you tonight ask, am I a partaker? I'm just going to stop there. I know about Jesus. Easter tells me what he's did. I understand what Easter did. I understand the resurrection. I even understand the, the ascension. That's nice. But what is necessary is are you a partaker in those promises? I'll get back to that. We're going to go another one. I'm not going to put it on the screen right now. I want to read verses 5 through 9 with you. It's the longest point by far. In fact, it's almost as long as the next three all put together. Please put your nose in Scripture, verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. And virtue with knowledge. And knowledge with self-control. Let's stop here. Remember we said that 2 Peter talks about the life we're supposed to live? He's at it right now. And self-control with steadfastness. And steadfastness with godliness. And godliness with, with brotherly affection. And brotherly affection with love. For if, there's that nasty word again. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing... They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. One more verse. For whoever, did you hear that? For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. All right, we're going to talk about this one now. We're going to talk about practices. I said there's going to be seven P words up there. Well, there's going to be seven pieces of this P word alone. Here we go. We are sitting, standing, in a Christian church. But it's more than that. We are standing in a Reformed church. Now, some of you don't know what that means, but many of you were born, born there just like this. So here's our basic tenets. A Reformed church firmly stands on grace alone, in Christ alone, by faith alone. Let me do that again so you can write it down. We are saved by grace alone, in Christ alone, through faith alone. But now look at verse 5. Look at it. Make every effort to <laughs> supplement your faith. about salvation here and neither is he. He's talking about what we do after salvation. Let's see if I can do it in better words. We are saved by faith, but that doesn't accept, exempt us from Christian action. Let me do one, one better. Actions will not save you, but actions are expected when you are saved. Can I do that again? Actions will not save you, but actions are expected when we're saved. Well, come on, narrow it down a little bit, Michael. I'm not going to narrow it down. Peter's going to narrow it down. I'm not going to do any of my clips in there, so I'll put it in my pocket or I'll hit the button by mistake. Let's go through seven virtues. Again, those in God's Word. Verse 5, the first one is virtue. It means these things. It means excellence, 
And it means righteousness. You're taking notes again. Virtue means excellence and righteousness. What does that mean? To do the actions and say the words that God tells us are right and good and wholesome. Virtue, righteousness, excellent words and deeds are expected to be part of our practices. Number two, that's how fast I have to go here. Number two is, and virtue brings knowledge. Okay. Well, ask yourself, Michael, when you talk about virtue, what does that mean? Well, here we go. How do we know what virtue is, or righteousness is, or excellence is? The answer, you'll listen to Christ. You read his written word. You have God's word in your heart and on your lap. God's word gives us that spiritual, yet life practical knowledge. We need to know before we can do, before we can say, or before we can be. You need to know God's word. Number two, knowledge. Number three, write this one down from verse six, self-control. Once we know the Holy Spirit is there to give us a fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 23, that's where the fruits of the Spirit, or the fruit of the Spirit is, is given to us. And the last fruit that is mentioned is the fruit of self-control. Let me give you an example. Everyone knows, I don't want to pick on anybody, so because the church party empty, I could get away without you scowling at me. Everyone knows that smoking or that overeating or that naughty language or reckless language or gossip or laziness or anger, I could go on for half an hour. Those are naughty things. They're bad things. They're wrong things. We know that. That's knowledge. But we can only obey the knowledge when we ask and when you embrace the fruit of the Holy Spirit, one of the fruit is self-control. It's literally saying, Lord, thank you for your word. I now know your word. Now would you please give me your Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Holy Spirit so I can now do what I know. Self-control. Help me to do it, please. Well, it doesn't stop there. Look at the fourth word. Look at verse 6 again. And, and, and self-control and then steadfastness. What is that mean? The practice of steadfastness is to not only start being virtuous or righteous or excellent. It's like, yep, I'm going to start this today. And you get about four, down, four steps down and, well, it's about all of where I'm going to make it. No. If we start on the path of a Christian virtue, if we start on the path of a Christian practice, we need to keep doing it. That's the definition of steadfastness. Don't just start it, do it. Number five, practice. Coming from verse six, it's godliness. See it? Now the word adds spiritualness to the words virtue and excellence and righteousness. We can say, you know, that guy's really nice, he's virtuous, he's excellent, he does this very good, you know, da, da. I understand that. But a Christian has to add a word there. There has to be godly virtue. You see the difference? There has to be godly excellence and godly righteousness. In fact, God says this, and Peter picked up on it. It says, be holy for I am holy. You know where that comes from? First Peter, <laughs> chapter 1, verse 16. And he got it from Leviticus 11, verse 44. It is to read about God the Father. It is to watch Christ the Son and then talk and be and act like Christ the Son with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's godliness. We've got two more practices to go. Verse 7, look at it. And then there's brotherly, I'm going to add sisterly affection for one another. To treat our fellow believers, and even those who are, I love to say this, not yet believers, will be Christ-like in our kindness to them. Are you listening? We need to have brotherly, sisterly affection to consider them better than ourselves. I just didn't say that. That's not how I talk. That's from Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. When our humility must be that of Christ, who consider others better than himself. People, Christ leaps from these pages and begs us through Peter, please, will you begin to have brotherly affection by giving to others? We know what we mean at this time in our country. By helping others, by uplifting others, by encouraging others, by inviting others, by bringing to others, and I could go on and on and on. That's our sixth practice. But 
There's one more practice we have to do. Look at it, and the last one is love. Of course, we need to end there because it's the Christian's highest practice, 1 Corinthians 13. In this Lenten season, I will quote a passage that will, will focus on Easter to show what love is. Now just look up for your Bible and, and just try to listen to this. But God showed us His love. He showed us His love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let me do just a little bit of a modern rendition of this. And God looked at us and He, and he wanted to say, these people got to see what love is. And God showed us His love in that while we were constantly going against God and Christ and the Spirit, Christ died for you. True love is being willing to give our all for someone else. That's the seventh practice. We're not done, however, with the practice word. Look at verse 8. Verse 8. Doing these practices will, look at it says, keep us from being ineffective and unfruitful. What does that mean? We need to live like Christ or we become ineffective and unfruitful. How do I mean that? People can't see what we know. <laughs> I preach a sermon and I'm going to preach it here sometimes if you let me. It's called Perpetual Students. They go to school, 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 they go to school. They're 40 years old. They haven't taught anybody. They haven't done any good. What they've done is they filled their mind with a whole bunch of knowledge. And they haven't done the world a bit of good because they haven't given them something. Not the Christian. People can't see what we know. They can, however, see every day our practices. They see Christ through our faithfulness and effective, visible practices. One more verse, verse 9. Not doing these practices is so nearsighted, it says, that we become blind and forget what Christ did for us. Jesus Christ, the little prayer, open our eyes to show others your nature that for through how through practices next ones will not be that long i promise let's go to the next one let me put the word up there the provided listen to verse 11 okay for in this way there will be richly <laughs> what does it say there oh yeah there's the word provided for you what an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our lord this will be very short, but verse 11 is actually the place to which all other points point. <laughs> Again, a man about to die for his faith, Peter, shows his 100%, can I do that because I love it, 100% assurance that heaven awaits him. No doubt. I have to ask you. If somebody would quarter you today, tonight, are you 100% sure that at the end of your life that heaven will be provided for you? Are you a partaker? That's all I'm going to do on that. Go to verses 12 and 14, and we're going to have this word. The, uh, the passing was prophesied. Look at verse 14. And, and Peter says, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon. That's real flowery. I'm going to die real soon. And then these strange words, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. What? What are you talking about? This is it. How long did Peter know he was going to die for Christ? You want the answer? 36 years. Jesus predicted his, his passing. Jesus, we think, left the earth somewhere around 32 A.D. Peter was killed the very year that Nero died in 68. If my math is all right, I think that's 36 years. Now, what did Jesus say to Peter? He said something from John 21, verse 18 and 19. If you want to pause a minute there, I'm going to read it. I didn't write it all up, but I'm going to read this. Just listen to this. Peter said, Jesus, truly, truly, I say to you, and I'm going to put this away because I'm going to do something up here. When you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, all of a sudden he goes into the future tense, talking to Peter right in his face. You will stretch out your arms, 
and another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. Now, what does that mean? Listen to verse 19. Jesus said this to show what kind of death Peter was going to glorify God. Jesus prophesied his death 36 years early. Peter's passing was prophesied. Now, I, I just decided it. Just in case you do not know how beautiful that prophecy was or how terrible it was, Peter was crucified. You know what crucified means? His arms were stretched out. They took his clothes off just like they did. They stripped him of his clothes, dragged him to where he didn't want to go. And when they got here, the, uh, the historians tell us that Peter said, you are not going to crucify me up like my Lord. You're going to crucify me upside down. I am not worthy to be crucified like Christ. Peter never wavered, never retreated. Never stopped preaching the gospel, even though he knew for 36 years the preaching of the gospel would kill him. And he didn't care. Wow, one more. Verse 15, the permanent. Read it with me. That you may be able to, at any time, there it is, to recall these things. What he said is, his readers, he's writing this, his readers would not ever, ever, ever be left alone. They will have Peter's writing. You're always going to have it with you. How do we know that? It's 2,000 years later and we're reading it tonight. <laughs> it's still there. His readers would never forget Peter's gruesome death at the hand of those who hated what he taught and hated, and hated the one he taught about. He wanted his life and teaching to be permanent in their hearts and memories. Christ was that important to Peter. We're done. People of God, if you ever want to know what's true and what's really important in a person, try to find them as they're dying. As Peter writes his second letter, just weeks before his death, he writes what is essential to him. I'm going to try to put most of these words up here in two sentences. Here we go. What's essential, Michael? What's essential is to be partakers in Christ's power and his precious promises. What's essential is to practice our faith as you look forward and go to that permanent place provided for believers after their passing. I pray to you that you are as certain about these truths as Peter was. Because you can be. Because what's written in God's Word, what Easter shows us, what the resurrection is key, is that you will be saved if you believe. Let's pray for your belief right now. Lord, whoever is listening to this, listen, I think they know the Easter story. I think they know that Christ died on the cross and rose again. If we push them, they know that. That's not where we're at tonight. Where we are at is, have they accepted that death and resurrection as their own? Have they said like Peter, Lord, I am a partaker in you. And I know, I know, I know that when this life is ended, I will live with you forever. If you believe that tonight, God bless you. And if you don't, may God really bless you with that knowledge. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. People of God go into the world and share the wonderful message of Easter, but not just at Easter, but through the all the year that Jesus died and rose for you. As you go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us now and stay with us all.